tone of the screen yes. and, and go to English. The, eh, exactly. Okay, good. Creo que por defecto los deja a todos en inglés, Dani. Ah, ok. Y los que deben elegir el canal en español son los estudiantes. Así que eso lo vamos a explicar al inicio, si no tenemos problema. Ok. Now we, a ver, I ¿ahora will... me escuchan mejor? Ahora mejor. Sí. Ok, perfecto. Eh, Flor. Sí. ¿Vos sabés que eh, Claudia ya está en el canal de... Eh, eh, y yo no entiendo español. por qué... A ver, si ahora sea, estoy... Cuando yo te pongo... A ver, estoy que este ahora momento. lo seleccione a ver si ahora sí. funciona. Mira. Y yo te estoy ahora eh, asignando como, como intérprete para que ambas estén. Ahí está. Ahora sí. <risa> Perfecto. Doctor Ashok, uh, from Mumbai, we have Doctor Ashok, who is the 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 boss of Ortho TV and our yeah. friend. Thank you for being here, Ashok. Good to see you, Ashok. Good to see you. Dani, creo que ya deberíamos darle entrada a los okay. que están en la sala de espera. Oh, eh, sí, yo ya les escribí que ya les vamos a dar entrada. Bueno. So, I, uh, what I oh, understand sorry. is that the first step is to uh, share the screen or to choose the, um, choose the channel. Ok, so... I will tell people in Spanish what to do with the channel. Okay. Muy bien. Bienvenidos todos. Les pido que aquellos que eh, quieran escuchar en, en inglés elijan el canal. En, esto, esto es solo para los que ingresan, no, no, no es necesario traducir. Eh, los que quieran escuchar el canal, en, eh, los que quieran escuchar en inglés, se quedan en el canal en inglés, tienen debajo en la pantalla eh, un globo terráqueo, eligen EN en inglés, y aquellos que quieran escuchar en castellano tienen el, eh, la posibilidad de elegir Spanish. Así que eh, así van a tener la traducción y van a poder escucharlo en inglés o en español. Ok. Dani, yo me parece que tendremos que ser puntuales, así que bien. si te parece bien, comenzamos ya la grabación y tú dices la palabra de bienvenida. Ok. We, we will begin, Dr. Kibler. Great. We will begin recording. Eh, Dani, la versión traducida, eh, ¿está alguien con posibilidades de eh, que, que, ese, que esté como co-host? Quizás... Eh, Marilina. Marilina Segura, ok. Entonces, Marilina, ¿vos vas a escuchar en español? Yo le pongo como co-host a Marilina. No te escucho, sí. decime con la cabeza. Ahora sí. ¿Sí ah, o no? Ahora sí. Escucho la versión en español y cualquier cosa ahí voy sacando las bueno, preguntas o esa parte, y, ¿te parece? Te pido, por favor, entonces, que vuelvas a, a español y que grabes la... ¿Sabes cómo grabar? Eh... ¿Tenés botoncito de grabar? Eso. Bueno, Exacto. yo voy a grabar primero claro. y luego tú grabas eh, segunda. Eh, una pregunta nada más. ¿Grabo en la nube o en la computadora? En tu computadora. En computadora. Ok. Eh, después de que comience a grabar yo. ¿Ok, Marina? Perfecto. Ok. Bueno, uh, well, we are ready. Dale, dale, Francisco. Recording in progress. Yeah. Well, we are coming to the end of our course on rehab that it is organized uh, of, between the Argentinian Shoulder and Elbow Society and the Spanish Rehab Society. So we have um, an audience from Spain and from all over Latin America, and we also have our friends from India. So this is going to be uh, also broadcast to India. Uh, we have the pleasure to have here with us 
Dr. Ben Kibler, that you all know. Um, Dr. Kibler is a good friend of our societies. Fortunately for us, he came down to Argentina a couple of times, and we expect to have him again uh, soon. Dr. Kibler, thank you for your kindness. I, we are ready to, to listen to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moya, and for the entire uh, team that is putting this together for Ortho TV. It's a great honor to be part of this. Uh, you all have asked me to talk a little bit about the roles of the scapula. I would like to break this down into two areas. One, first part is what does the scapula do in shoulder function and dysfunction? The second part would be how do you evaluate this and how do you do some treatments to uh, make this more functional. I'm at the Lexington Clinic in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. As a basis for this, we'd like to go over a little bit about the scapular anatomic mechanics. This has several parts. The first part is we know anteriorly, the clavicle is a curved strut to uh, stabilize the scapula to the bony structures. Posteriorly, the muscles provide dynamic stability and movement of the scapula. This results in a triangular base for arm stability and mobility to place the arm and hand in multiple positions in space. The AC joint and the ligaments, or the AC and CC ligaments, form this pivot, stable pivot, that creates this three-dimensional motion that is necessary for arm function. Scapulohumeral rhythm, the coupled motion between the scapula and the arm, is both two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Two-dimensional, uh, the normal uh, scapular humor rhythm is two to one, but there are certain times when it's different numbers, but basically the scapula moves as the arm moves so that the acromion is elevated to optimize the arm elevation. This requires a force couple activation to dynamically stabilize and mobilize. The instant center of rotation of the scapula moves from the medial border to the AC joint as the arm is elevated, as this diagram shows. In the upper diagram, it shows that the serratus anterior and lower trapezius act to stabilize the scapula uh, in a downward direction. Then as the arm gets into the overhead position, the instant center of rotation moves out to the AC joint. However, it's more complicated than that. It's a three-dimensional motion. This is a... Um, model taken from our lab showing the motion of the scapula with arm motion. This, uh, each of the uh, colored axes represents one of the motions. The green is anterior posterior tilt, red is upward downward rotation, and blue is internal external rotation. This video runs four times so you can watch one of the motions each time. As this starts, you can see watching the red, the Scapula moves upward rotation. If you watch green, it goes into posterior tilt. And the blue, it goes into a little bit of internal, then goes to external rotation as the arm goes overhead. The result is placement of the acromion into the most advantageous position for arm function. Now, alteration of that is called scapular dyskinesis. And this is a clinical observation at this point in time. It's an altered resting position or altered dynamic motion as the arm moves. And the key on this is prominence of the medial border of the scapula so that you can actually visually see this. Uh, we, cause this we call this a protraction. And it's more commonly seen as the arm is, is brought down from the overhead position. We'll show some examples of that. Now, kinesis is normal scapular resting motion or dynamic 
from that dynamic motion with the arm. Dyskinesis is alteration of this. And it's either altered resting position, altered motion. It is, it's not a diagnosis. It's an impairment, which means it interferes with normal arm function. It's part of the injury process. It can be a cause or an effect, as we'll show you in a minute, but it needs to be evaluated and treated as part of the treatment of the shoulder. This is a good example of this. Uh, this is a patient who you can see that on the left side, the scapula is of normal position. And the right side, you can see the resting position is altered. As, you, as they move the arm, you'll see the difference between kinesis and dyskinesis. You watch as the arm is elevated, you see, and especially with the arm brought down, you see the protraction, the prominence of the inferior medial border, showing that you do not have control of that inferior medial border as you try to move the arm. Now, this is, once again, from our motion capture system. You can see that the right side is to your right. And if you watch, you see the arm, that the scapula is anteriorly tilted, and it, you notice it does not raise up as high as the left side does. And you see the compensations of the trunk and ribs as they are trying to compensate to allow for more overhead motion. You can see this very well uh, on this from looking from the top. You can see, once again, that uh, now the right shoulder is on your left. You see that the acromion does not move out of the way. It does not elevate enough so that you get impingement. This is the mechanics of impingement. The acromion does not move out of the way of the moving arm. So there are several ways that scapular dyskinesis then interferes with arm function. The first is that because it's an impairment, it has the potential to affect scapular roles. It may not be right at that time, but we know from studying in American baseball players that if you have, in, that have this dyskinesis, you have an increased risk of having problems. 43% increased risk of subsequent injury in patients who demonstrate, while asymptomatic, a dyskinesis. The second is the most common, and that is uh, associated with symptoms. 67 to 100% of patients with shoulder problems will demonstrate scapular dyskinesis if you evaluate it and look for it. Whether it is a cause or an effect, we don't know because it's sometimes one, sometimes the other. But as part of the diagnosis, you need to evaluate for this. The, the old saying, you, you may not have seen it, but it has seen you, is very true in terms of scapular dyskinesis in shoulder injury. Many, many diagnoses, impingement, rotator cuff problems, internal derangements of the shoulder joint, multidirectional instability, biceps tendinopathy, certainly arthritis, both pre- and post-op. We'll show examples of this. The third way that scapular dyskinesis is affecting shoulder function is that it can you can use this to help determine treatments if you already have an anatomic injury, such as a fractured clavicle or a high-grade AC joint injury. The loss of the strut function tells you that the scapula yeah, is involved in the mechanics of the shoulder is not right. And you can see this with the scapular evaluation. Finally, the, all of the neurological problems, uh, the long thoracic nerve uh, injuries, the accessory nerve injuries, and this uh, problem called scapular muscle detachment, all of these will be uh, causes of scapular dyskinesis. Okay, so that's, that's the problems that we see. So let's go over some cases to illustrate this point. This first case is a very common situation that all of you all will see in the office. It's an overhead worker. He happens to work at a car manufacturing plant here. He has symptoms of impingement, inability to do his normal job without having pain. He's had an injection with short relief. He has had no relief by the open chain exercises and modalities. And so he was referred to see uh, for subacromal decompression or maybe rotator cuff surgery. He wants to know if there's anything else 
that's going on. So you can see that this patient has the clinical findings of the anterior shoulder pain. He has a painful arc. He hurts and in pain right on the anterior border of the shoulder, right at the chromium. He has no loss of rotation. So this is not a, an adhesive capsulitis. He has pain uh, right over the front. He has weakness in testing of forward flexion strength. Well, let's look at the back. Maybe he's got a rotator cuff problem, but let's look at his scapula. The resting position shows a little bit of asymmetry, but you really see it with motion. If you watch as it comes down, once again, you'll see the prominence of the entire medial border of the scapula, very well demonstrated. So that means that the scapula is in an altered position. So therefore, the shoulder joint cannot work as well for this because it's actually impinged. Now, you can actually do a couple of tests to identify the scapular involvement. One is called the scapular assist test. You actually stabilize the scapula and assist its posterior tilt and upward elevation. And when they do that, you have complete relief of the impingement symptoms, showing that the scapular malposition and different motion is part of the problem. You can do a scapular retraction test. You stabilize it in retraction. You find that now the forward flexion strength has returned to normal and the symptoms have gone away. That shows you that the problem is more in the scapula than it is in rotator cuff. You treat this patient with proper therapy and he does not need surgery. So in impingement, there's been lots and lots and lots of studies that show that patients with symptomatic impingement have decreased in ability to posterior tilt so that we can play what we call culprits and victims. The victim is the anterior shoulder. The culprit, however, is the, post, is the anterior tilt and the loss of retraction. Similar, many, once again, many, many studies show that protraction decreases the subacromial space and that uh, if you activate the serratus anterior or the lower trapezius, it increases the subacromial space, getting rid of the impingement. We know from a, from the standpoint of uh, injured shoulders, rotator cuff disease, we know that uh, if you put the arm in the scapular retracted position, you can improve forward flexion strength by 24%. So we know that stabilization of the scapula in a retracted position facilitates and increases rotator cuff or forward flexion strength and shoulder. Well, let's take another case of a rotator cuff injury. This is where the, whether it's an acute injury or a chronic injury, they have actually rotator cuff disease. There are lots of patients who will do well with scapular-based rehabilitation, change their symptom pattern and do not need surgery. Uh, Non-operative uh, rehabilitation to correct scapular issues in chronic tears show an 80% decrease in symptoms uh, that do not need surgery. And this is stable over two years. This is the data from Journal Shoulder and Elbow showing that 80% of the patients, after they stabilize after about what, six to 10 weeks, will stay in this situation so they will not need or request surgery. So very definitely, scapular rehabilitation should be a major component of the early treatment of chronic rotator cuff disease. Let's talk about uh, throwers, uh, patients who have labral injuries. Uh, we know the labrum sits on the glenoid and the glenoid sits on the scapula. So sometimes we can actually uh, change those symptoms as well. This is a baseball thrower who has all the findings of a labral pathology. He has what's called a positive dynamic labral shear test. He hurts right in the back, right on the posterior joint line. However, if you stabilize the scapula in retraction, you find that the actual impin internal impingement symptoms are released, removed. So they have no uh, uh, symptoms at that point. It doesn't mean that we've cured the problem, but this indicates the need for scapular rehabilitation as part of the treatment. This patient still may need surgery, but he needs the rehabilitation as well. We do know that uh, from previous data that anterior scapular tilt 
increases the forces on the base of the labrum and on the rotator cuff by quite a bit, by uh, 30 or 40 percent. So very definitely just removing that anterior tilt will decrease the symptoms and the compression. Uh, and another study showed that increased, if, if, if you decrease upward rotation, you increase the area of the internal impingement. And if you increase the internal rotation, you also increase the area and the pressure of the internal impingement. So once again, scapular position affects the mechanics of the rotator cuff and the labrum. Does this happen? Well, in our data, it shows that uh, both internal rotation and upward rotation are altered in patients with injuries in the area that is of most concern, which is above 90 degrees of abduction. So very definitely, scapular position, once again, places the shoulder and the shoulder contents at increased risk of injury. Well, let's go to another case here. Let's talk about a, a very common clavicle fracture. This is an 18-year-old U.S. soccer player. He fell and landed on his shoulder and has this particular injury. Now, you know, you say, well, what are the treatments? Well, most of the time this would be treated non-operatively, but is that really the case? I mean, this, is, this can signify a major loss of mechanical stability for the entire arm. And this is the reason why, because you have a lot of deforming forces on this fracture, CC ligament torque, muscle activations, the weight of the arm, um, internal rotation of the scapula, all creating an anterior rotation of the distal fragment. And you have the scalenes actually pulling the medial fragment up. So therefore you have this dynamics that do not create a normal mechanical uh, position or motion of the clavicle even if it heals, or certainly in the scapula in the arm. And you may have seen this patient in your office. He, this is a patient who has a established union of his clavicle fracture, but you can see from the front the, the drooping of the scapula. And from the back, you see the prominence of the inferior medial border showing once again this anterior rotation of the entire distal fragment of the clavicle and the scapula because it's attached through the AC joint. We did a 3D CT on a patient with this healed malunion. And you can see obviously that the distal fragment is anteriorly rotated. The medial fragment is posteriorly rotated, creating not only a angulation, but a mal rotation. And this is a major problem. And you all know that if you try to osteotomize this, you run the risk of stretching the brachial plexus, you have the problems with healing of this fracture. So it's best not to even get into this situation if you can help it. Therefore, you can use the scapula as one of the indicators for whether you need to do surgery. Most studies show that if you fix this uh, surgically, that they, the functional outcomes are usually better and the complication rates are usually less than if you treat this non-operatively. Well, let's talk about this case. Now, this is a slightly different. This is an older gentleman who is very active in cycling, bicycling. He has this fracture. And you say, well, that should do well because it's basically out the length. It's not shortened. But he knows, he, he, he knows there's something not right about that. He's seen another doctor who told him to put it in a sling but he feels that this is not right. He's, he's only two weeks post-injury, but he knows his shoulder is not right. This is him. And you can see that he's still got the bruising from the healing. He has really minimal symptoms at the fracture site itself. He's got that callus. This sort, But look at the drooping of the right arm. That tells you that there's not a mechanical stability. He has impingement symptoms. That's as far as he can raise his arm. He has pain along the lateral acromion, not at the, at the clavicle. Why? Because you can see the alteration of the scapular position, this anterior rotation, lateral tilt, because of this. Now, you can reduce this fracture like you normally do. So you And what I do, I move the arm, and I bring that back. Now I stabilize him in this position, and, he's, and he can move the arm better, he has much more motion, and he feels that his, subjectively that this is the way it's supposed to be. 
So we tell him, well, this is, we can do this surgically. This is a good indication for surgical intervention because of this uh, change in symptoms. So that's a reason you can think about it. Well, so this is him now, after we threw, did a plate on him. It's three weeks post-op. And he has good positioning of his shoulder, good stabilization of the scapula and retraction, and ability to raise the arm. So once again, as a reason for having good ideas about surgery, you can look at the scapular position. This can help you in your, uh, in your case. There's another very interesting case of a man who is eight months post uh, reverse total shoulder replacement. He was sent to my colleague, Dr. Morris, because he had a painful shoulder. So the question is, does he need a revision of this reverse shoulder uh, uh, surgery? which, of course, is a big surgery. So if you watch this, you will see that, once again, he can only raise his arm, and it's kind of painful. He can raise his arm up to about 90 degrees with pain. And you notice he does this a couple of times. You'll notice the scapula, see, inferior inferior medial border starting to be a little bit more prominent. He can't raise his arm any higher than that. So my uh, colleague does a scapular assist, and he can raise his arm normally without any pain, showing once again that the problem is that the scapula is not moving because he has not had the proper rehabilitation of the serratus and low trap. So once again, this guy does not need surgery. He needs the proper rehabilitation. And one final case. This is uh, something that we see not commonly, but this is a 25-year-old worker with repetitive lifting job. Six months of weakness, and they, he once again cannot raise his arm. Very, very, very limiting uh, condition because he cannot raise his arm. Once again, you'll see the huge amount of scapular dyskinesis, inferior border prominence. He cannot raise his arm above 90 degrees. Every other muscle in his body is normal except for the serratus anterior. He had an EMG that's positive for that. So he needs this is an indication that surgery is necessary. And then you have to do your muscle transfers, and this is the result you can get. So scapula is very, very helpful in um, examination of the scapula is very helpful when you have problems with a wide variety of shoulder problems. All right, so hopefully I've made, made you interested in the scapula and its role. So how do we evaluate this? How do we look at this? How can we start doing some treatment? So you, we have developed this algorithm uh, of evaluation, a stepwise progression in the algorithm. Because what is, what is really present? Well, we know that up to 50% of the time in shoulder pain, there are abnormalities of the leg and hip, and flexibility and strength. And this is very important because you really get maximum scapular muscle activation if you have normal hip and core strength. So about 65% of the time, hip and core is weak. 90% of the time, scapular dyskinesis is present. Altered shoulder motion is very common, and certainly altered anatomy. So you really have to put together a very comprehensive evaluation to understand how to properly treat the shoulder problem. So we look at this as three steps. The first is to establish, does scapular dyskinesis exist in this patient? The second does scapular dyskinesis play a role in the clinical presentation? And the third, if it does, what are the causative factors? There are limit, there, there are certain things that cause scapular dyskinesis, and we can check for each of these. So the first is with a patient has shoulder pain and or dysfunction, check to see if it's present or absent. The way you do this is we call the scapular dyskinesis test which is you look at the static position, then you have them move their arm in forward flexion in the scapular plane three to five times. You observe the medial border and you say, is the medial border asymmetrically prominent or is it not? If you need a little extra help, you can add some weights and you can add the reps. This will sometimes fatigue the muscles and show this a little bit better. 
turns out that this is pretty good as a test. It's a sensitivity is 0.82 and its positive predicted value is 0.84 when compared to bone pin studies. So therefore it's a useful test. If you see the scapula uh, prominent, then it does exist mechanically. There, then you do these corrective maneuvers that I've shown you. One is called the scapular assistance test where you assist the scapula in rotation. And the positive there is relief of your impingement symptoms, improved range of motion. And once again, to do this, we have them raise their arm, check the amount of motion they have and the symptoms. Then you just stabilize and assist. You don't push it, you just assist as they come around. And you, what you do is you actually raise, increase the posterior tilt and upward rotation. The second is a scapular retraction test. And once again, here, the positive, you stabilize the scapula and retraction. Uh, your, your forearm fits very nicely along the medial border of the scapula. Then the positive is uh, increased rotator cuff strength or forward flexion strength, change in internal derangement symptoms. Once again, the, the test is performed. You check strength. And then you stabilize the scapula in retraction and check the strength again. You'll find you the, the strength is improved, up to 24% improvement. Then you have to evaluate the causative factors. You can place these into these boxes. Um, and uh, they all have to do with either the pathoanatomy, something, some injury, or pathophysiology, where the muscles are not working well. It's very interesting that if you look at these, you find that the one, the boxes that represent the pathoanatomy, the damage to the muscles, the fractures, the AC joint injuries, clinical humeral joint injuries, or neurological, they actually, in a big series that we did of over 400 patients with scapular dyskinesis, they only accounted for about a third of all of the cases. So while you, you need to find this, they're not going to be the most common. The most common are going to be the ones that involve some aspect of alteration of muscle function, either strength, balance, tightness, flexibility. This uh, very commonly called serratus anterior lower trapezius insufficiency, we call it salty. Uh, it has where the serratus anterior and low trap are inhibited. They don't work well. Uh, we're talking about hip and core weakness. Once again, over half the patients. Certainly the shoulder muscle weakness that you can normally test for. Muscle tightness, especially the pectoralis minor and latissimus dorsi. And then this loss of control where you really do not retract well. These are all things that can be identified on the physical exam, but they have to do with muscle activation. Now there is a stepwise progression of the exam. You can start and you do this in about five to 10 minutes, you look at hip and core weakness first. You palpate for along the media border for a scapular muscle detachment. You measure shoulder muscle strength weakness. You check for muscle tightness. You look for uh, uh, loss of conscious control. You look for the salty scapula. You do your exam of the glenohumeral joint and AC joints. Look for fractures and then check neurologically. This is the entire universe of problems with the scapular dyskinesis. So now let's talk a little bit about rehabilitation. My partner and colleague, Dr. Shasha, has been very, very uh, interested in this. And remember that rehabilitation is a very important part of this, whether there is pathoanatomy or there is not. If you have your positive scapular dyskinesis test, positive corrective maneuvers, but no pathoanatomy, and this is all the physiology, then rehabilitation is by far the major uh, uh, treatment uh, protocol. If you have a scapular dyskinesis test that's positive and your corrective maneuvers are positive, and you have these signs of that pathoanatomy, in a certain percentage, up to 40%, rehabilitation will still take care of the symptoms so that you, surgery is not necessary. You give it six to weeks, six weeks or so, 
If not better, then you're talking about surgical indications. Now, with clavicle fractures, AC joint injuries, you may elect to go to surgery fairly quickly. What's your plan? What's your, the way you do this? We establish posture, so that we look at the entire hip and core and trunk. We establish the proper motions so that you get the scapular position and motion and the arm motion uh, in the normal pass, uh, pathway. We facilitate scapular motion by using your lower extremity and trunk. So you actually drive the scapula by using hip and trunk motion. We'll show you this in a minute. We exaggerate the position so we do ex excessive retraction while controlling protraction. We tell the patients with scapular retraction, we want to put their elbow in their back pocket. So we ex exaggerate this retraction position to really emphasize how important that is. We do closed chain exercises because the arm weighs something against the scapula. And therefore you want to minimize the load on the distal load on the scapula. And then we work in multiple planes because the body is a three-dimensional structure. It's not an individualized muscle and it's not a two-dimensional motion. If trunk and hip weakness is present, you can check this out by doing what's called a one-leg stability series where you have them stand on one leg. If you see them lose hip, and tr hip control because of gluteus medius weakness, then you obviously need to start with your hip and, and, and core function. You can do a one-leg stance. You watch how they lose three-dimensional control because they have no uh, hip and core stability. We want to always facilitate. So you actually make sure you emphasize it in the right position. If you're not careful, you'll ask them to retract and they'll, and they'll do it the wrong way. So you need to make sure that you uh, facilitate and you key in the proper position of the scapula in retraction. We want to un we want to control the exercise movement by putting it in the right position with no load. We unload the rotator cuff, and we can do this a lot with using a, a ball so that you actually achieve the disc the shoulder motions you want without putting the distal load on the arm by gravity. Uh, if you unload the rotator cuff, you uh, decrease the stress on the repair or on the impingement. If you've got substitute patterns so that you have too much protraction, then you want to start once again by decreasing the load, having the closed chain, and driving with trunk motion instead of scapular motion. Similarly, if it's weak, and you want to work on low trap and serratus, you do, uh, you put the arm in the right position and you emphasize short movement arms. We like standing positions because it activates in the way that the body activates, using a hip and trunk to facilitate uh, the position and motion of the scapula and the arm. We use kinetic chain focus with short lever arm, keeping the arm close to the body when we first start, using the legs and trunk to drive, especially in these diagonal three-dimensional patterns. Uh, there's many, many ways of doing this. Now, if you eventually, you'll need eventually to go to long lever arm, but you do not start there. You start with a short lever arm and you do not try to isolate this segment, you try to integrate the segment because this is the way the body works. Now, occasionally you have to isolate to really activate, but once again, this is in a closed chain environment, not with an open chain with the arm uh, exposed to gravity and force. So the progression is short lever arm maneuvers to a long lever arm facilitated by trunk rotation, and then you use long lever arm. So here's an example of some progressions that are uh, beneficial. So once again, you start by using your hip and trunk extension to drive scapular retraction and arm positioning with the arm down to the side with a short lever arm so you don't put much load in a pro, there's no protraction load on the scapula in this position you're driving. Then you can do a bilateral, it's called a robbery, where you once again you, you do bilateral because now you're facilitating posture 
you're facilitating integration of both scapulas and arms. Then you go to uh, rotations. It's called a lawnmower maneuver. Driving with the hip and trunk, ending up with a scapula in the in the retracted position and the elbow in the back pocket. Then you can add weights and movements as they achieve this capability. You see, we're still very short lever arm and we're still very close to the body. Then you eventually get into longer moment arms, long levers with, once again, integrated function from the hip and core all the way to the hand. Then eventually you add more difficulty with stepping maneuvers with either ipsy lateral or contralateral. Contralateral is the best muscle activation, so you eventually want to get to the uh, contralateral as well. You can do this even in the post-operative situation where you can actually uh, keep patients in the sling. Once again, keep their arm close to the body to scapular retraction. There's no load on the rotator cuff or the plantar humeral joint with this motion. And you're driving your hip and trunk, getting your scapular retraction. Then eventually, once again, as you the first motion is close to the body, then eventually, and see we're still close to the body, we're still driving with the hip and trunk, scapular retraction. Then eventually integrating the shoulder and rotator cuff muscles as the healing goes on and as their base, their, their physiological base is capable of facilitating those motions with the best strength. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk and certainly we would like to start uh, asking questions and discussion. Lovely. Thank you very much, Dr. Kibler. was very clear. Uh, you gave us a general idea of the role of the scapula and the subscapularis muscles uh, and dyskinesia. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, you, you said that it is worth to try uh, the rehab uh, of course, we have done that for many years related to impingement syndrome with very good results and uh, subacromial decompression has almost disappeared as yeah. a procedure. Yes, 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 yes. But what about uh, acromioclavicular acute dislocations or separations? Because if I have a... Yesterday night, I did my last one, a type three dislocation in a young person who plays polo, and it was a, an acute one. If I wait and I try rehab, the type of surgery I will do is, is different. It's not a reparation, it's a reconstruction. So what is the limit? Very good. That's an excellent question. And it gets right to the to the role of what is this injury and how does it affect your ability to, to, to treat it? And also, how does it affect their ability to uh, use their arm? The This type three, of course, is the most difficult type uh, to deal with because there's grades of from a little bit of injury to a lot of injury of the ligaments. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, um, Isakos uh, uh, had a um, committee several years ago, I was part of this, where we looked at uh, these AC joint injuries and we realized that probably this type three has two really separate components. There's the type 3A, where probably the actual injury is to the AC ligaments and maybe a little bit to the trapezius, trapezoid ligament. But the conoid ligament of the C ligaments may be intact. Now, in those, uh, the loss of the stabilization is not as high, and the mechanics of the scapula is such that a lot of times the scapula will stay in a retracted position. In those, rehabilitation will work about three-fourths of the time in re in reducing the symptoms, allowing normal function. Now, what I usually do is I will look at the patient like you do in the acute situation, and I will reevaluate them at about 10 days to two weeks. Okay. At that time, 
their symptoms are kind of down and you can look at them and you can, say, you can still do a repair or a reconstruction, whatever you do. And if you see that the scapula is protracted, then you know that these patients will do much less well non-operatively sure. and they will need to have the surgical treatment, whatever your surgical treatment is. So I think very definitely, you're right. There's this gray area where we don't yeah. know what we should do, but the the scapula is telling you what it's, what it's doing <laughs> as a result of this injury. And because if you leave that scapula in that protracted position, then you do have, first of all, problems with raising your arm. Second of all, you do have more surgical treatment that you may have to do. Now, in our case, we wrote this up with our technique in the Journal, show, in, in the journal of Arthroscopy in 2017. And uh, we do an anatomic reconstruction in both situations, yeah. uh, whether it's acute or chronic. But the idea is we know which ones probably would be better to be operated on sooner rather than later. So using the scapula as one of the clinical indications may give you some better information and it'll tell the patient some information like we did with that clavicle fracture. We said, okay, if we do this to the, to the clavicle, so that the scapula is here, then you're going to work better. Uh, you may get that way if we don't operate on you, but I know I can get you that way if we operate on you. He said, operate on me. I want to get better. Lovely. Great. Great. Dr. Samantha has a question, Sergio. Let's yeah. give him yeah, the yeah. chance. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The thing is that uh, Dr. Bain, this is a, obviously, it was an excellent presentation again to listen to you every time I'm listening to you. thing is that uh, the, the question is that when you, when you decide that like, you pre-slap or the get loose, the, when they usually they come, they, how, how do you decide uh, the which uh, sort of exercise or the rehab? Because we have to catch them early. So how you take them, catch them early? And how, what is your protocol of rehab? Because that's the point of we can take those before the posterior tightness happens or the anterior capsule is stored or the yes. slab. Yes, very, very good point. And I think there are probably three directions we go with this. The first is to make sure that we don't lose that capsular, uh, that we don't get that capsular tightness or that muscular tightness. So we really emphasize glenohumeral range of motion. We very definitely do that. Uh, the second is that we start uh, all of our patients, as soon as, let's say we see this patient uh, before the season and they have this dyskinesis, we know that there's going to be a risk of injury. We will start them on actually hip and core exercises with scapular attraction. That, that last little progression that that uh, female patient had, we actually start them on stepping, retracting, and pulling the shoulder blade back into this position right here. So we get the ability to do the scapular retraction first. The other thing is you got to make sure that the pectoralis minor and the latissimus are not tight because a lot of times those muscles need yeah. to be mobilized before you could ever get them into this position right here. So we really work on, on glenohumeral motion, pectoralis flexibility, hip and scapular, hip and uh, core retraction with the scapular position. We keep everything below the shoulder level. Then we eventually add into there. And we do not let them throw much until they get these uh, capabilities. We find that it usually takes about three to four weeks to get this. Then we let, then we see them again. And if they are improved, then we can start them on the throwing and more vigorous activities. But yes, very definitely. You've got to start early before these things become so, so fixed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, if I can, if, if you no, go ahead, I, Sergio, uh, go ahead, go lovely, ahead. Lovely. Dr. Kibler, how are you? I'm Sergio, shoulder and elbow hey, surgeon no. from Brazil. Sir, uh, I have an interesting question. The thing is, I see a lot of cases like this in the office, and many times they come, they come with much myofascial trigger points around the scapula. I see this, I would say, basically every day as yes. a specialist in the office. Yes. So what I've been doing for about 15 years is I do, before I send them to rehab, I do dry needling of the myofascial points. And this has been something that has 
helped me tremendously yes. in my yes. life. Uh, in the base of the, the, the superior trapezius, in the anteromedial border of the scapula, and medially parascapular. And sometimes even I do some uh, yes. needling yes. in, in mm -hmm. the back minor, mm -hmm. and then I send them to rehab. Yes. So mm -hmm. what do you think about dry needling of parascapular myofascial point? Because this yes. is very important in my practice. Sir. Yes. And we, what we have found, you're exactly right. What we have found is that if you, if a patient has symptoms of shoulder problems and scapular problems for more than about six to eight weeks, and they usually do because they have a little bit of pain. They're using their sure. arm. You know, they, sure. but, they, but at about six, to eight weeks, they start altering their, their neuromuscular uh, activation. The muscles get inhibited. They get these trigger points. Yes. They start getting tight. And the worst thing is that their brain kind of forgets how to move their shoulder, the scapula in the right position. Yes. What I will have them do is I will have them stand uh, about, oh, maybe a meter or so away from the wall with their hand on the wall. And I'll ask them to pull their shoulder blade back and down. Mm -hmm. And you'll find they'll do, all, they, they can't do it. Their yeah. brain is not connecting well with this. So, so we have multiple problems. You're exactly right. And a lot of these are driven by these pain responses, whether it's, I don't know, trigger points, whatever. So indeed, if I find this, they've lost this conscious control, they have mm -hmm. all those trigger points. And the yes. other thing, you're exactly, they're all along the trapezius, the medial border, their peg minor, and their lat. Don't forget the, the lat. The oh, lat yes, in through here, yes, the lat. Yes, yes, the lateral border lat of gets, the yeah, Because the lat, while it does not really attach to the scapula, it attaches to the humerus and pulls everything forward. It's yeah. a big yeah. muscle. It tends to get very tight. So we use a lot of dry needling. As the, prepar as the preparation to doing these exercises, this is I mentioned with the slap, you've got to get rid of the tightness before you can ever make the muscle activate. And if you try to do these exercises with your arm way out here and you start these as the first exercise, you will find that this fails every time because all they end up doing is, is one of these numbers right here. So you have to get, so when the pec minor is tight and the lat is tight, then the shoulder sits in this position so yeah. now as you try to retract it, it won't go. And, and that's why, that's why in those muscles, the, the, especially the low trap, are put on length. And so they tend to get more of those uh, trigger points. So, yes, you got to relieve. I will even go as far as sometimes as to do Botox. Uh, well, in, Botox, the worst, Botox. In, in, some, in some of the worst conditions uh, where they're really spasmodic. You can do this. But yes, indeed, if you have a patient and they tell you they've had shoulder pain for more than six or eight weeks, then they will, in a large number of those, will have those problems that you have to deal with before you can do. Because remember, actually, with the scapula, it's not always that the muscles are weak. They're just inhibited and they don't have this normal motor pattern. And so that's why you have to get that because they're really on the skin. If you look like they're weak, you stabilize the scapula, they're not weak. <laughs> they're just inhibited. So you're exactly right. You got to get rid of that pain, get that position and re kind of retrain the brain that this is the normal position rather than this is the normal position. And you'll see, this is my last comment from a, a functional point of view, I have read this in some books. There is a similarity with patellofemoral syndrome okay. in which many, many muscles, they are not working well. Do you think, do you agree with me, sir? Yeah, see, the scapula is a bone that glides in three-dimensional space with very sure. little static stability. It's basically muscularly controlled, and its function is to allow the arm to be all over the place the way it's supposed to. The patella is a freely mobile, very minimally anatomically stabilized, but it's a dynamic stable and it kind of goes where it wants to go. And those muscles, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't want to call the scapula the patella of the shoulder, but it's basically, sure, sure. and the other thing is that just like the VMO is the worst muscle for the patella, the sure, serratus sure. anterior is the weakest and, and, the most important, but it's the first muscle that goes bad in a scapula. I mean, it does. When that when the serratus anterior is deficient or inhibited, then the scapula tilts, 
And now you're in a problem, then you're compensating from here <laughs> everywhere else in your arm motion. What? Uh, Dr. Kibler, we have a question from the audience. Um, Sofia Belgeri asks, which is the role of the latissimus dorsi in uh, scapular dyskinesia? The latissimus dorsi has a, probably an indirect role in that it doesn't, a, a few of the fibers may attach to the inferior medial border, but basically it's, it's, its effect is um, through its attachment onto the humerus. And so because it's a very long muscle, it's a very important muscle, it tends to become tight with repetitive use, especially in, for example, throwers where you're doing this all the time. It's, it's constantly being put on eccentric load, so it tends to get tight. Workers in this position tends to get tight. But the other thing is because so many of us sit in a protracted position all of our, our day around our computer and things like that, it tends to become adaptively tight as well. It has a great uh, tendency to have trigger points. And therefore, as you raise your arm in this position, uh, it tends to make you go into a protracted position. Uh, mm -hmm. Our therapists really believe that the, uh, what happens is pectoralis minor gets tight, latissimus gets tight, so you, pro, you tend to have this protracted position. The serratus gets uh, inhibited. And then the lower trapezius, which is the force couple with the serratus, gets inhibited. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call the salty scapula, serratus anterior, lower trapezius, insufficiency. And, and, and it's very, very common, that this combination of problems. And you have to address all of them Uh, and once again, it's not because the serratus is necessarily weak, it's inhibited. And the only way you're going to get that uninhibited is to get rid of the tightness of the pectoralis and the latissimus, because basically these two muscles basically just pull the scapula into this protracted position. So you're kind of in this position right here, and then you have to stretch it. But uh, it's a very powerful muscle in American baseball. It's the main muscle that allows the arm to go forward. And so it's a very important muscle, uh, but you have to treat it with respect. You'll have pain all along the lateral border of the scapula, right in through here, right along this, you can just palpate, and they, they hurt a lot over here if you sure, palpate sure. over there. Do we have time, so? sorry, Sergio, oh. uh, we okay. have time for two questions coming from the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, if you think that working on neuromuscular proprioception improves Um, the patterns of movement, movement patterns. Yes, yes, that's, that's, you have to reestablish the normal proprioception. You lose that, that, that loss of voluntary control, that's the problem. You lose that, and until you gain it back, the body doesn't know how to, how to, you can have them do a retraction exercise, you know, like you would normally do, but if you don't know how to do it, you'll end up doing it the wrong way, and therefore you got to train it the correct way. Here's the correct position. You got to train the body to that position. Good. And the, the last question from the audience: uh, Do you know how long that does it take to the brain to be retrained? Lovely question. <laughs> <laughs> it takes by, a long time. Industry. It takes a long time. I tell I tell my patients that have this problem that it's going to be at least four to six months to get this back. And this means that you have a really good therapist and you really know how to put your arm in this right position. Uh, and it, it takes a while because remember, they've been in this for a while and they've lost a lot of this control. Uh, the ones that have the anatomical, the fractured clavicles, things like that, you saw they, they get better pretty quickly. It's those pathophysiology ones that take such a long time to retrain everything. It takes a long time. What's well, Martin, Martin. Dali, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Kubler. Great talk. Thank you very much. What is your uh, experience with uh, SLAP type 2 uh, introvers? Um, we are just presenting, uh, we, we just sent a uh, paper to the Journal of Arthroscopy uh, in which we have, have shown, I think, pretty conclusively that if you really look at the uh, arthroscopy of the throwers, The main problem is not the slap. The problem is a posterior extension of the slap down the posterior. So my experience is that if we fix the, the posterior component from about 10 o'clock 
on the right shoulder down to about seven o'clock, that's where the tear is, then those patients do well. If you try to fix the slab, and you put the 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock anchors up there, you limit the motion of the biceps, you limit the motion of external rotation, the lot of strain on the biceps, and these are the ones that you're going to have the failed uh, slap. And that's why the slap has gotten uh, a fairly bad reputation because that's, you're not really fixing that problem. Our paper from 2013 showed that a lot of times these slaps are what you have to have to get this this superior uh, detachment, you need to get your arm back in this position. But when the slap extends down beyond 10 o'clock, that's when you get this loss of humeral head control and therefore you get the symptoms. So if you have those, if you have a patient who is a thrower and have pain posteriorly, look down there, the injury is posterior uh, about three fourths of the time. Sergio, your last comments. No, uh, I, I would just uh, ask something which I think is very practical to Dr. Kibler because when I see these patients, Dr. Kibler, in my office, and it's very common, many times they have, at the same time, scoliosis, scoliosis. I see this all of the time. And I think that managing scoliosis is as important, I would say, with uh, postural rehabilitation as managing the scapula itself. So I think that we must have an eye to scoliosis. I guess that your patient in case one, there were some scoliosis in that man. So I think it's important. So how important is this? And how do you, uh, you put all of these in a combo in terms of rehab? This is a very practical question, sir. Yes, you exactly right. Well, you know, the, sca the scapula sits on the ribs and on the, <laughs> so it's there. So wh whatever the ribs are doing, the scapula has got to accommodate to that. I, actually, in our practice, I see more kyphosis than I see scoliosis in terms okay. of this problem. But any type of problem where there, you've got to mobilize as much as you can. Now, the problem with scoliosis is usually a, most of the time it's fixed fairly rigid. So you have, if you, but you can work on some of that flexibility and derotation. We use a lot of thoracic mobilization on the kyphotic one mm -hmm. because the, that, that's a, that is a lot of soft tissue. In that situation, we can get the back, we can get the, everything stretched in the front. We really work on soft tissue mobilization. So, and we work a lot on three dimensional rotation as a, as a key. So, you have to work with what your bones will allow you to do. But as much of the soft tissue, especially in kyphosis, we really pay attention to that as well. Yes. Lovely. Now, uh, the last comments by Dr. Samantha from India. Yeah, the, I think, sir, to, to the question what my dear friend Sergio was asking, because when we test about the scapular dyskinesis, the lordosis is also very important because if this guy is having hyperlordosis, automatically the scapula is going to the protracted position. So because sure. this is the trunk, which is the kyphosis and also the hyperlordosis is very important for the protracted scapula. How you take care of the Dr. Ben for that and for this for the trunk? Yes. We, once again, if you saw, we start on hip, core, and trunk exercises as the very first exercise we do. So, the, so we feel if you don't have that stable base, then you're not going to be able to effectively do your rehabilitation for your scapula. So, very definitely, all the hip and core stability uh, is 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 so very important uh, to get the mobility, but mainly to get the the core strength uh, around the lumbar area is is one of the keys and one of the very first things we try to do. Okay, Dr. Kipler, we don't want to take more of your time. It, it was really enlightening and uh, we need you to come back to Argentina. Uh, <laughs> this is not a, a, just a comment, it's an official invitation. <laughs> so we, we will be in touch to organize that. Well, uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Laura Muñoz from Spain, who has joined us, and Marilina Segura, who is the coordinator of the rehab section of the Argentinian Shoulder and Elbow Society. They have worked, both of them, very hard to, to put this uh, course online. So it is a pleasure, sir, as usual, and we will keep in touch, and hopefully we will have you soon in Argentina. Well, just once again, thank you so very much for inviting me and, and participating in this. 
as you can see, there's a lot of interest. As you can see, there's we can we could probably spend another two or three hours here very yeah, easily. Sure. But yes. thank you all, yes. thank you all very much for uh, yeah, being interested, and I look forward to further uh, discussions, uh, hopefully in person, uh, but if necessary, virtually. Just thank you all very much again. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. We also thank, thank Ortho much. TV and online education for their support and. Have you all a good uh, weekend? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Recording bye -bye. stopped.